another Wednesday night service here with Brother Tommy. This is Worship on Wednesday. Hey, this is an old song my daddy used to sing, and I'm going to do it in his key. He loved the key of it. Well, I guess. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Yeah. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need nobody to tell us what it's all about. Jesus brought me through all of my troubles. Jesus brought me through all of my trials. Jesus brought me through all of my heartaches. And I know my Jesus ain't going to forsake me now. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. Me and Jesus got it all worked out. Yeah. Me and Jesus got our own thing going. We don't need nobody to tell us what it's all about. Well, we don't need nobody to tell us. What it's all about. <laughs> well, I'm laughing at myself. You laugh with me. That's just an old song that my daddy used to do. And here's one that I used to do. They'd do this one and then I'd sing. Well, put your hand in the hand of the man who steals the water. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently By putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee Every time I look into the holy book I want to tremble When I read about the part where the carpenter clear the temple All the buyers and the sellers were no different fellows than what I profess to be and it causes me shame to know I'm not the man that I should be. Put your hand in the hand of the man who steals the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. By putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. I like this verse. My mama taught me how to pray before I reach the age of seven. And when I'm down on my knees, I said, when I'm close to heaven. Daddy lived his life with five kids and a wife. He did what he could do. And he showed me enough for what it takes to get you through. Put your hand in the hand of the man who steals the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Come on, one more time, ready? Put your hand in the hand of the man who steals the waters. Put your hand in the hand of the man who calmed the sea. Take a look at yourself and you can look at others differently. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. By putting your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Father, thank you for this night. Just bless us now as we share together. We love you and thank you, Lord, that we can place our lives in your hand. And the Bible tells us that no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing this one with me if you would. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place I can feel his mighty power and his grace I can feel the brush of angels wings I see glory on his face surely the presence 
All the Lordies in this place In the midst of his children The Lord said that he would be It doesn't take very many It can be just two or three And I feel that same sweet spirit that I felt all times before Surely I can say That I've been with my Lord Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place I can feel His mighty power and His grace I can feel the brush of angels' wings I see glory on His face Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place Sing that chorus with me again and just kind of ask the Lord to move upon your heart and your life Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on His face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. You know, He is such a great God, and to think that we have the privilege of having the Lord Jesus in our lives, and knowing that the reason He's in this place is because He lives and dwells within you and me by the power of the Holy Spirit. I got to thinking uh, the other day about... Uh, what we're dealing with with the coronavirus and some of the issues and the matters and I just started singing this old song I was riding down the road and I'd been listening to some other folks sing and then I just said well let me just sing this old song and I just began to sing it so let me sing it to you today and it went like this give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us and now let the weak say Because he's given Jesus Christ, his son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Because of what 
Lord has done for us. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Amen. He humbled himself and carried the cross Love so amazing Love so amazing Jesus Messiah Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sin. Thank you that we can thank you, we can praise you, you're in our presence. Thank you for being the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Lord 
of all. Bless us as we do our Bible study now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want you to take your Bible and turn your Bibles with me to Proverbs chapter 12. That's right. Proverbs chapter 12. Let me swing around here. Put this old guitar up. I know I could be playing that nice 12 string I got, or I don't know, I got five or six other, maybe more guitars than that. But I just kind of like playing that one. Plus, it looks good and fits me good. And when you're getting short and fat and old like Brother Tommy, you need everything you can to fit you. How you like? I'm getting ready for the summertime. Got my summer shirt on here, trying to buff up. Let me kind of get it a little tighter for you. See if I can kind of get the, look, the summer look. I'm going to have to get a tan. I'm going to have to lose some weight. Because it's about time for Brother Tommy to take a beach trip. If we can stop all this social distancing thing. As a matter of fact, tonight I want to speak to you on the subject of following instructions. Following instructions. I hope this can help you. And that's what my prayer and my goal is. Is that I can help you to understand how that in your life and in my life. That we have to follow instructions instructions. Now, if you remember, last week we talked about the businessman. You remember that? In uh, chapter 11, and, and I enjoyed that. I mean, we talked about being honest and being people of humility, and then we talked about being a hypocrite or a heretic. We don't want to be in hypocrisy or be a heretic. Instead, we want to be people who are honest and people of humility in our business life. The week before that, I talked to you about how that Literally, uh, Solomon was speaking to Solomon and how that he talked about his testimony and his treasures and then he talked about the truths that last forever. So tonight, in the 12th proverb, proverb number 12, which I think is about number 16 in the book of Proverbs. I wasn't taking them all one proverb at a time, but I am now. And so I'm going to deal with all of these, I think it's 28 verses. And uh, so I want to give you a little introduction and then I want to read this passage of Scripture as we walk through it tonight. So if you'll listen to me tonight, we're not going to be here real long. I'm not going to go the full hour, I think, from looking at the clock. I'm going to go about 22 minutes on this. And if I do that, y'all can be doing like this. Now, when you get back in church on Wednesday night, don't be expecting that. It will be a full 6.30 to 7.30 worship experience. But this proverb is very, very important. And he speaks here about following Instructions. So now notice what he says, beginning in verse 1, and that's my introduction. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. <coughs> now, I, I know you don't want me to use that word, but that's what's in the text. Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Now, when I first looked at this passage and read through the whole 28 verses... I could not help think about my own life, in personal life. I'm not the best handyman in the world. I mean, if you give me the right tools, I can do some things. And I, I'm good in yard work. And, you know, I love guitars and that type of thing. But when it comes to, to fixing things and all that, I'm not real good. I'm a good demolition guy. Miss Joyce Chambers will tell you, I'm not good at putting anything together. But I swung a sledgehammer a few times and I could, I could demo some things. But. When we go to put things together, and we used to do that a lot, you know, during the Christmas season and then getting gifts and things of that nature with the boys, uh, and even putting things together for Mr. I Am, I don't like reading instructions. I never have. I'd rather take the box <laughs> and look at the picture. I'd rather look at the picture and try to figure it out. And if I can look at that box and, and I can see the picture on it, uh, about 50-50, I can put it together and get it together right. I'll never forget one time. My oldest brother and I were going to put up a swing set for my boys. And so we started working on this swing set. And it was a nice, it was really a gym set. Really nice one. And uh, my oldest brother was like me. He didn't like to read instructions either. But my other brother, who's my second oldest brother, Jerry. Mike's with the Lord now. Jerry, one that you know. Uh, he, he's good with his hands. He can build stuff. He can uh, put motors together. I mean, he's done anything you can do, and he can do it with his hands. And so I ended up having to call him. He may remember this. I had to call him, and I'd say, hey, come and help us put together, if you would for me, this gym set. And so he came and rescued me because I just don't like to read instructions. But you know what? There were times when I didn't read instructions, and I'd get into that setting like that, and I'd feel a little stupid. That's what this text says. He says, those who don't follow instructions or can't take corrections, 
He's really stupid. That's what the Bible says. Okay, I'll use this term. He's an ignoramus. He's ignorant. Uh, he's a blooming idiot, okay? We'll use that term. Uh, but the Bible says that the person who cannot follow instructions is foolish. Now, that's really what he's saying. I hesitate to say this because I don't want to offend anyone at all. You know, we're at that stage. We're trying to be nice to everybody. But the bottom line is, if a man or a woman or a boy or girl will not receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they are not making a wise decision. They are making a foolish decision. And what we try to do here at 1025 Church is we try to give instruction. Instruction in how you can receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's direction. That's leading them in a path. We also try to give instruction on how to live your life. Sometimes that goes well. Sometimes people get a little frustrated at us. Because people don't like to follow directions or instructions or even to take correction. So, in this passage, I've simply entitled it, Follow Instructions. Follow Instructions based off of number one, verse number one. Now, in following instructions, he's going to talk about seven types of people. And so, I've just called them different men. As a matter of fact, he's going to talk about a good man, an established man, a married man, a wise man, a righteous man, a prudent man, and a lazy man. So let's get right down to it. Let's follow instructions. And first of all, he speaks to a good man. Look at verse number two. He says, a good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked intentions, the Lord will condemn. He will condemn. But now focus upon a good man, the Bible says, obtains favor from the Lord. Now for salvation, it's not being a good man. For salvation is being saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus. And he'll save a good man or a bad man. But in this text, as Solomon is writing, he's talking about someone following instructions. And he says that person will be a good man. And notice what the Bible says. He will find favor with the Lord. Now that word find favor there deals with this. He'll receive blessings from the Lord. The Lord will look at him and smile upon him and say, hey... This is a good man. Now, we want to say a godly man as well, but a good man, and the Bible says he will find favor with the Lord. So, first of all, if you want to in your life and in my life, you want to be a good man. And the Bible says the good man will follow instructions. Secondly, he not only says that a good man will follow instructions, but then he says there is an established man. Look at verse 3. A man is not established by wickedness, but, here's the establishment, the root of the righteous cannot be moved. And so the righteous man right here is a not only a good man, but he is an established man. So as uh, Solomon writes here, he's speaking and he says very clearly, follow instructions, be a good man, read the manual, follow instructions, read the book, Follow instructions, live by the word, but be a good man. But now he says, be established. And he uses the terms here. He says, a man uh, will be rooted uh, of the righteousness that cannot be moved. Now that reminds me of what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7. And I believe it's over around verse 24, 25, 26, somewhere in there, where Jesus talks about in Matthew 7. He talks about building your house. And he says, now you can build your house upon the rock. Now the rock there is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you build a house upon the rock, hey, the rains are going to fall, the floods are going to rise, and the winds are going to blow. And you're going to have troubles and trials and tr issues in your life. Everybody does. But your house will stand if it's built upon the solid foundation of Jesus Christ, if it's rooted upon Christ. Now, if it is not rooted upon Christ, then listen, you build it upon sand. And you build it upon sand, and the rains are going to fall, and the floods are going to rise, and the winds are going to blow. And you know what happened to your house? It will fall. Now, the joy of being the Christian and the believer is this. The established man builds his house upon a solid rock. Let me give you instructions. If you build it upon sand, when the storms of life come your way, your house will fall. But if your life or your house is built upon the rock, the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, the storms of life will come your way, but your life, your house will 
stand. So he speaks about a good man. He speaks about an established man. And then Solomon speaks about a married man. That's right, a married man. Look at verse number 4. <clears throat> he says, Here's an excellent wife is the crown of her husband. But she who causes shame is like rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked are, lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and no more, but the house of the righteous, the Bible says, will stand. Now, he's certainly talking about the established man and the good man, but he's talking about the married man as well. For you know, he starts out this whole paragraph in verse 4 and he says, An excellent wife, an excellent wife, a wife of valor. A, you could use the term, as uh, Proverbs 31 does, a virtuous woman. Here is a wife who is a virtuous lady. Uh, he has a wife now. And it's important to understand that he now lists the things that can cause shame or cause wickedness upon his life. And you know, the, the proverb says, he who finds a wife, a good wife, finds a good thing. So here as he approaches this passage of scripture, this is very clear to see that he's speaking here uh, about following instructions. And uh, you know as well as I do, uh, <clears throat> I almost said something that I thought, well, I shouldn't. He's not saying this. He's not saying, fellas, follow the instructions of your wife. Although maybe sometimes we should. That's not what he's saying. He's saying make sure that your wife is a righteous lady, a lady of valor, that she is a godly lady. That's why I'm oftentimes telling guys, you know, when, when you start dating, make sure you look to that young lady you're going to date because you could fall in love with her. Uh, look to her mother and see what her mother is like. But most importantly, check and see where her relationship to Jesus Christ is. Is it in a right relationship with Jesus? the Lord. Make sure you know that. Please make sure. That is so very important because your wife can either build you up or she can tear you down. Now ladies, it's the same with you. Make sure that your husband or the guy you date could be your husband because you could fall in love with him and make sure that he is a godly man. But in this instance, Solomon's writing and he says, I'm speaking to a good man, an established man, and I'm speaking to a married man. He says, if you follow the counsels of the evil ones or the wicked ones, they are deceitful. Uh, don't listen to the world when considering a wife. You listen to the word of God when considering a wife. Here's what the Bible says. Do not be unequally yoked. Every gentleman who is looking for a wife needs to find a Christian wife, if he's a Christian. Christians marry Christians. Every lady, if you're looking for a husband, should be looking for a Christian husband. Christian ladies marry Christian men. So he's speaking here about that of the man who walks with the Lord, who's following instructions, following directions in his life. Then he looks to the wife, and the wife needs to be godly. And not shameful, but spiritual. Did you hear what I said? Not shameful, but spiritual. Spiritual. Let me give some kudos out to Miss Diane for just a moment. Sometimes I call her Lady Die. I love it. Miss Carol Smith sent me a note today, and in that note she uh, said, Lady Die. I thought that was cute. Well, I can tell you we'll be married 42 years in October, and I can never remember a time when Diane brought shame to my ministry or to my life. Never. Now, I'm sure with me preaching and doing ministry and some of the crazy things I've done, I've probably brought a lot of doubt and shame to her. But she's never brought shame to me. It's always been the spiritual life. You know, I, I thought about that when I was reading this passage. Our uh, dating life was based upon our spiritual life. It wasn't based upon uh, our intimacy or our sexual life or even our attractions. Although I thought she was very attractive, just a little blonde, blue-eyed, and had a brand new car. And, and, you know, I wasn't tall, dark, and handsome. She says I was short, dark, and handsome. I had long hair, and I was dark, and maybe I was a little cute, okay? But she was a beautiful young lady. But from that time we started dating, our lives were about our spiritual life, even to this day. Everything is about our spiritual life. Now sometimes we certainly probably aren't real spiritual with each other like we should be, but we still know that there's a spiritual life there. And I want to brag on you, pastor's wife, for a moment. 
I do not know of another lady who is as godly as Diane Fountain. She is a godly lady. She walks with the Lord. She prays for her children. She Oh, she prays for her grandchildren. She loves you. She is a partner in ministry with me. And so I want you to know she never brings shame. She's always about the spiritual matters of my life, her life, the kid's life, a grandkid's life, and about your life. Now, here it is. Follow instructions, guys. If you're going to marry somebody, you're going to fall in love. You find a good spiritual lady to marry and to fall in love with. Same thing, ladies, with you. You find a good spiritual man to fall in love with. So he talks about a good man, an established man. He talks about a man who is married. And the fourth thing he talks about is a wise man. Look at verse 8. The wicked are overthrown, he says, and are no more. But the house of the righteous will stand. Look at verse 8. A man will be commended according to his wisdom. How wise is he? But he who is a perverse heart, who has a perverse heart, will be despised. Better is the one who is slighted but has a servant, but has a servant than he who honors himself but he lacks bread. Now he's speaking about having wisdom there. For you see when he says in verse 9 there, he says, better is the one who is lightly esteemed but has a, as a servant than he who honors himself but he lacks bread. In other words, the foolish man will waste his belongings, but the wise man will take care of his stuff. Let me put it that way. He will make sure that things are right because he says, a man will be commended according to his wisdom. Gentlemen, every one of us have made poor decisions in life. You know that. I'm speaking to men for a moment. Every one of us have made poor decisions. Uh, you know, back when I was younger, I wish I had not done this as much as I did. But I had a brother who was a car salesman, and uh, he got into Elf and I and the financing. He did very well in that life. And I don't know. I just like new cars. And I don't know. About every two years, man, I'd find a reason to get a new car. Matter of fact, he, he joked one time. He said, every time you need new tires, you get a new car. And that may have been true. I didn't do many oil changes either. You know, I'd drive one 30, 35, 40, 45,000 miles, and I'd get me a brand new car. Well, you know what happened with that after a period of time? Even though I'd tell him, hey, this is what I want my payments to be, uh, and he'd get them there. Uh, and I shouldn't tell this because he can't get in trouble now. He's with the Lord. But uh, back in those days at Jay Autumn, oh, I, I never signed uh, anything on my cars. He could sign my signature as good as I could. He knew my Social Security. He filled out all my paperwork. I'd go by the showroom floor. I, this is the truth. I'd go by the showroom floor. and Y'all love this. And I'd pick out the car on the showroom floor. The guys there for probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years or more, they would laugh at me all the time. I'd come in there and say, Oh, Lord, there he goes. He's going to the showroom. And I'd get the nicest one. Because the one on the showroom floor you know, had the lights on it and it was all clean. It looked better than the ones that were on the lot. So I always bought the vehicle, whether it was the sports car, the family car, or the pickup truck, or the, or the van. I always bought the one on the showroom floor. And I'd say, hey, this is what I can pay for it. And I'd give him my payment. Well, you know, he'd run it through and all that. But you know what happened after a few years? I got what you would call upside down in vehicles. That's not wise. That's poor decision making getting upside down on vehicles like that. So I've made some poor decisions in my life. But I've also made some wise decisions in my life. Can I tell you one of the wise decisions I made? We adopted as our family verse, Matthew 6, that says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So we sought the Lord first. We put him first place in our lives. And you know what? God did something great in all of that. He began to move miraculously. And I believe the reason we're here where we are now at 1025 Church is because we made a wise decision to put Jesus Christ first. So he, he talks about men here. He says, listen, there's a man who's a good man. He's an established man. He's a married man. He's a wise man. And then the Bible says, number five, he is a righteous man. Look at verses 10 through 14. He says, A righteous man regards the life of his animal, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. He who tills his land will be satisfied with bread, but he who follows the frolicity, which literally means, that word would literally mean that he's going, in verse 11, 
that he's going to work on some cultivation of it. He tills it. That's working on it. Now he's talking about he who follows anything that's empty or vain things. He says he's devoid of understanding. He doesn't have the things in his heart. He doesn't understand it. Now here's what the wicked does. Now the righteous man regards the life of his animal. He's a righteous man. The wicked covet the catch of the evil men, but the root of the righteous, he yields fruit. So he speaks about the righteous man regards the life of his animal. Now the righteous man, the Bible says, for the fruit of the righteous yields his fruit. The wicked is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous will come through trouble. And then he says, here's the righteous, a man will be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands will be rendered to him. So here is the righteous man. I love how he talks about it here. He's not only satisfied in verse number 14 with the fruit of his mouth, the Bible says that he also has the fruit of the righteousness. He will yield fruit, and the Bible says he will regard even the lives of his animals. In other words, that was dealing with his livestock, that was dealing uh, with his business, as well as what we could go back to chapter 11 of Proverbs. But then he starts talking about that of his fruits. So the righteous man walks with God. The wicked man does not. He gets caught in the snares of the evil one, the snares of the wicked one. But the righteous man is just the opposite. He is literally satisfied with the good, the Bible says, by the fruit of his mouth, even what he says. He's a righteous man. So here's the pattern he's following. Here it is. Now listen. He says, look, follow instructions. Be a good man. You be established in the Lord. If you be a married man, you get the right woman. You be a wise man, but you also are a righteous man. In other words, you are to bear fruit in your life in being a righteous man. Now here's the sixth man. The sixth man, the Bible says, is a prudent man. Look at verse 15, and I, I'm going to have to read through verse 23 because the word prudent here literally means one who's well advised, one who is cautious. Paul called it in Ephesians to walk circumspectly, so you're to be circumspect. It's literally acting with or showing care and thought uh, for the future. So to be a prudent man, looking ahead. Listen to what the Bible says. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who, he, he who heeds counsel is wise. And a fool's wrath is known at once, but a prudent man covers shame. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, and the tongue of the wise promotes health. The truthful lip shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but counselors of peace have joy. No grave trouble will overtake the righteous. But the wicked shall be filled with evil. Listen, lying lips. Now he talked about a lying tongue. Now he's talking about lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But those who deal truthfully are his delight. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims foolishness. So here is the foolish man. He acts spontaneous, spontaneously. He... Uh, uh, speaks before he thinks. His mouth uh, gets put in neutral and never in gear. He is always caring about folly. And you'll notice here when he talks about the prudent man, he's speaking about his lying tongue or his lying mouth. Now I said when he speaks about the prudent man. I, I shouldn't have said it that way, so forgive me. Let me go back up. When he speaks about the foolish man, he speaks about the lying tongue and the lying lips. But the prudent man doesn't do that. The prudent man sees the big picture. He's looking at everything at the whole. He's not just concerned about I, I, me, me. He's looking and he is concerned about every one. So the prudent man is looking to the future. Now let me just parallel that with you for a moment. I'm looking to the future, aren't you? Do you know the older I get, the closer I get to the time I'm going home to be with Jesus? You know, there was a preacher last Easter Sunday uh, who's a very prominent preacher in Southern Baptist Convention life. And he was preaching. He's in his 70s, maybe late 70s. 
And he finished his sermon. His wife had died a few months ago. And he talked about the struggle he had had. But then he talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And gave a powerful, strong invitation. I believe the pastor was from Texas. And you know, when he finished preaching, just after he finished recording that sermon, he died. He had a massive heart attack and died. My boys were talking about that. And they said, wow. that's some... And I said, wow. What a way to go. That man, that gentleman, was looking to the future. He really believed, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Now I'm telling you, you better be looking to your future. You better be looking to your future to know this. If you walk in foolishness and you do not choose to be wise, and you do not choose to be righteous, this is vital for you to hear this. Your future is doomed and you will spend an eternity in a devil's hell. But, if you will walk with the Lord Jesus, if you will surrender your life to Jesus, and you will get saved, and you'll walk righteously before our Lord, and you'll know that you've been saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, your future is bright. You know why? You've got a home awaiting you. The Bible says you've got a mansion awaiting you. So you can rejoice and be glad that God has given you a future. This world is not your home. We're just strangers and pilgrims who are passing through. But you can have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and know that your home, your citizenship, is in heaven. Do you know that today? Are you a prudent man? I want you to be saved today and be prudent. Now, he ends on a negative note, okay? He talks about a good man, an established man, a married man, a wise man, a righteous man, a prudent man. Now, here's the negative. And I'm going to close with this, but I'm going to bring us back around to the positive. He talks about a lazy man. Verse 24. The hand of the diligent, the man who's not lazy, he will rule. But the lazy man will be put to forced labor. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression, but a good word makes it glad. The righteous should choose his friends carefully, for the way of the wicked leads them astray. But the lazy man does not roast. The Bible says, listen, the lazy man does not roast at all. I mean, does not roast at all. The Bible says in this setting, um, this is important. Because he says here in this passage, um, we the righteous should choose our friends carefully, but the lazy man does not roast what he took in hunting, but diligence is man's precious possession. And then he says, in the way of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. For the righteous there is no death. For the righteous there is life. But for the lazy man, now let me put that into perspective in two different ways, two different categories. In the world in which we live, have you never noticed the lazy man is always trying to beat somebody out of something? Or he thinks people owe him something. He's always trying to beat you out, or he thinks somebody owes you something. That is the lazy man. But now, secondly, listen to me. The righteous man, the working man, the prudent man, the wise man, uh, the established man, even the married man who wants to provide well for his family, and the good man, he works hard and God provides for his needs. Now, that doesn't mean he becomes wealthy, but it does mean that God will supply his every need. Uh, let me close. There's no room for laziness in any of our lives. Gentlemen, ladies, don't be lazy. God did not call us to be lazy. He called us to be light in a dark world. So make sure you are light. You know, I love you. I want you to consider what I've said tonight. Would you be willing to follow the instructions of the Word of God? He says, if you don't, you're foolish. You're an ignoramus. He actually said you're stupid. Follow the instructions of the Word of God and be a good man, established man, a married man, a wise man, a righteous man, a prudent man, and don't be a lazy man. Father, we love you. We thank you. Call us to righteousness to walk with you. 
Help us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. And remember, we're always alive at 1025.